Okay. Okay, we're good to go. Okay, I think we're going to get started now. I'd like to begin by thanking you all for being with us tonight. We're really uh, grateful to see the enthusiasm for memory and um, dementia related research from our community. So thank you for being here. And just to introduce myself, my name is Ruth Slack, and I'm the, a professor at the University of Ottawa, and I'm the director of the Brain and Mind Research Institute. So on behalf of the researchers and our administration team, um, we welcome you. Um, de la part de nos chercheurs et notre équipe, je vous souhaite de la bienvenue et je vous remercier, remercier pour votre participation. So tonight is actually a special evening because this is the kickoff of Brain Health Awareness Week. And as you can see, we have presentations uh, every week. Um, the objective is to actually raise awareness about brain health in the community and also to tell you about the latest research discoveries in the uh, University of Ottawa Brain and Mind Research Institute which is a worldwide leader in neuroscience research and also the discovery of new therapies for the treatment um, of brain and mind related disorders. So to kick off or to start off a Brain Health Awareness Week, we have a short video from Dr. Mona Niemer. And Dr. Niemer is a professor also at the University of Ottawa. She's a researcher from the Brain and Mind Research Institute, and we're very proud to say she's the chief science advisor to the government of Canada. And that's a crucial role, really, to promote medical research across the country. So let's look and listen to uh, Dr. Mean Niemer's uh, video. Bonsoir tout le monde. Good evening, everyone. I'm Mona Niemer, the chief science advisor of the government of Canada. I'm also a professor at the Faculty of Medicine here at the University of Ottawa. It's a great pleasure to welcome you all to the kickoff of Brain Health Awareness Week. The brain is one of our most valuable assets, right up there with the heart, and we need to promote and preserve the health of this important organ. Malgré sa merveilleuse complexité, le cerveau humain est très sensible. Les troubles qui affectent le cerveau ont aussi une incidence sur le fonctionnement de l'organisme, l'humeur, la capacité de penser et le comportement. It's estimated that one in three Canadians will face at some point in their lives brain disease, whether it's mental health, illness, a brain injury such as stroke or concussion, or a degenerative disease like dementia or Parkinson. This is increasingly a challenge on our university campuses as well as among the aging population. We need to double our efforts in prevention and healing. And for this, we need more research. Les meilleurs établissements de recherche à travers le Canada, comme l'Institut de recherche sur le cerveau de l'Université d'Ottawa, forment des collaborations en recherche sur le cerveau et des partenariats pluridisciplinaires afin d'accélérer les découvertes visant à améliorer l'état de santé de la population. Such collaborations between scientists and the community are critical for science dialogue with the population and policymakers. Cure is for today. Research is about improving tomorrow. Brain research is the path to prevention, treatment, and hopefully one day, cures for brain disease. It's about ensuring a better quality of life for all Canadians. Thanks to all the researchers and the volunteers who are making this important event happen. Bonne semaine de la sensibilisation à la santé cérébrale. So we'd 
like to thank Mona Niemer for all her support because she really plays a crucial role in increasing um, research in brain health in Canada. So now we'll move on to our program for tonight, which is navigating the world of memory and dementia. And by the uh, enthusiastic interest um, in the program tonight, in fact, this program was oversubscribed over a week ago. So really, I think it's an area of significant concern to the community. And I think uh, new research in uh, finding cures and better treatments for dementia is urgently needed. And I think everyone in this room must have a, a friend or a family member whose life has in some way been touched by dementia. And um, it's really a devastating uh, disorder in Canada. Just if you just think about Alzheimer's alone, there are 600,000 people diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. And that doesn't count the people that are undiagnosed and other forms of neurodegenerative disorders. Um, so this is really an area of concern. And uh, right now, there is no cure. And I'm sure you do, as I do, I ask myself the question almost every day is why is this, in this day and age, are people still suffering from the devastating effects of dementia? Because over the last few decades, there have been med many medical breakthroughs, many scientific discoveries. For example, vaccine development. Also, 50 years ago, or more than 50 years ago, we were able to put two men on the moon. Now, a half a century later, we're still struggling to find treatments for dementia. And why is that? Why is this such a daunting task? So we ask ourselves this every day in the labs when we talk to cl clinicians. And one of the reasons may be is that there's still major gaps in our knowledge. The brain is probably the co most complex organ of the body, and we still don't understand how the brain works. We don't fully understand how memories are made, how they're stored, and how they're retrieved. Another point is that maybe the answers have been out there, or a lot of the answers have been already out there all along. In other words, maybe ch small changes in lifestyle could make a big difference. And that speaks to our keynote lecture that you'll hear today from Dr. Hakeem, who will talk about saving your brain seven rules to uh, protect against dementia. And finally, a third question that we think of is, do we need to make fundamental changes in the way we traditionally do research? And this is something that we're working on and that we're constantly working on at the Brain and Mind Research Institute. So for example, traditionally, um, the discovery research would work independently in their lab to try to decipher the circuitry or try to understand how the brain works. But if we're ever to take the discoveries from the lab and apply it to clinical research, the, the basic researcher has to talk to the clinician. And the clinician or the neurologist that is treating patients with dementia can't hope to do that if we still don't understand how the brain works. So what we do and what the Brain and Mind Institute does is it brings these multiple, multidisciplinary teams to work together so that the basic researcher discovering the circuitry talks to the clinicians and the clinicians talk to the researchers to help inform the study design. And also, we all need to be in, in, um, in constant communication with the community leaders, with the patient groups, and also the caregivers to really know what matters most to the patients. So what we do is we bring all these groups together to work as multidisciplinary teams. And we really feel by doing this, we can really accelerate uh, research 
in brain and mind related disorders. So one example where we're doing just that is a collaboration between uh, the Brain and Mind Research Institute and the researchers and the clinician researchers at the Elizabeth Briere Research Institute, and that's called the Memory Collaborative. And so we're going to hear about those studies tonight. So it's a real pleasure to introduce Dr. Heidi Sveistrup, who's the director of the Briere Research Institute. So welcome. I think maybe I'll just do that. Does that work? It's more for the other rooms because I have a loud enough voice. I could do this for this room, but not for the other room. Um, I just wanted to say a couple of years ago, I had the opportunity to sit at a table with our scientists, I'm a, I'm a University of Ottawa scientist and also a scientist here at the Brain and Mind, as well as the CEO of the Research Institute at uh, Briere. And I was having, um, I had an opportunity to sit with a number of scientists and community members, and we got to talking about the problems that we're facing in research. And I think Dr. Slack uh, raised them very nicely. The community members said, how do you know that something that somebody at the university has found out isn't what you're also trying to do across the city at your institute. How do you know that that's not happening? Do you guys ever talk to each other? Um, and I said, well, we don't talk to each other enough. Um, they said, how do you know, how do your trainees know? If you have a trainee, all my trainees, we work with people. We're looking at quality of life and movement. How do your trainees know what another trainee who might be working in a mouse model, how they understand research in memory. And I said, you know what? My trainees have never seen a mouse that doesn't know how to do the water maze, the Morris water maze. They, they don't know what that would look like in a mouse model. And I bet you somebody who's working in neural computation and looking at some of the brain circuitry on a computer, they probably have never had the opportunity to speak to a husband and wife where one of them might have dementia. And so we said, you know, that's what the Memory Collaborative is going to do. It's going to bring our trainees together and it's going to bring our scientists together. So since that time, we've actually had what we call a spin workshop where we have students from my lab and from Dr. Knoffel's lab, Dr. Ismail's lab, together for a whole day. And they visit every single lab. They start at 8 in the morning, and at 8 o'clock at night, they don't want to go home. They're still learning from each other. Our scientists are now being funded to do joint projects, where we're saying, you cannot work with people that you normally work with. You have to start working with people who are outside of your scope of interest, so that we can start to cross-fertilize. And that's what this Memory Collaborative is doing. So I'm really thrilled to be able to introduce our first two speakers. Um, our first speaker is Dr. Nafisa Ismail. Both of our speakers, our first two speakers, are the directors of the memory and cognition group in the brain and mind. So Dr. Ismail is an associate professor at the School of Psychology at the University of Ottawa, and her research interests relate to neuroimmunology, neuroendocrinology, and critical periods of development. She did her uh, undergrad degree and then her PhD at Concordia and a postdoc at the University of Massachusetts. She runs what she calls the NICE lab. Now she's got a spelling problem here because she spells with an S, but we'll give her that. Um, so she runs the NICE lab and they investigate the neurochemical mechanisms through which immune challenge and hormones during the prenatal and pu pre, uh, pubertal periods uh, alter behavior. And she's looking at things like social behaviors, depression, and cognition. She works with a small rodent model to understand the mechanistic insights. So we can uh, listen to her and how she's using her, uh, her lab and her trainees. Thank you. Dr. Nikisa. Thank you, Heidi. I'm very honored to have the opportunity to talk to you tonight. Um, so I'm here with two of my graduate students, Daria Komogorova and Madeleine Kearns. Um, they are both in the atrium, and so after the workshop, they'll be happy to talk to you more about the research that we do and also show you some brain slices from human brains. Okay.
So you know, memory is one thing that we take for granted until it malfunctions. But we should be thankful for memory, because if we didn't have memory, every person would be a stranger. Every language would be foreign. Um, we wouldn't be able to function. Every task would be a new challenge. But memory allows us to recognize people we meet. Um, it allows us to communicate and use our language. It allows us to find our way home, to locate food and water. Needless to say that memory is essential to our survival. So what is memory? Well, to understand memory, we first need to understand what learning is. And learning is essentially permanent changes in our brain and behavior that result from us interacting with our environment. And memory is essentially learning that persists over time. So it is information that we have acquired by interacting with our environment. Let me begin by telling you first how impressive your memory is. I could show you 2,000 faces of individuals for 10 seconds each, and then select randomly 280 of these faces, mix them up with other new faces, and you would be able to recognize the faces I showed you previously with a 90% accuracy. Now, humans are not the only animals that have a good memory for faces. Take sheep, for example. You can show sheep faces of sheep and um, associate some of them with a food reward and others with no food reward. And two years later, they will remember the sheep faces that were associated with the food reward. Now, that is memory for faces, true, and we don't just have memory for faces, but this shows you that there is basic processes between animals and humans that are common, and we can use these basic processes into more complex cognitive tasks. And one complex cognitive task is arithmetic. Meet clever hands. He's a German horse that belonged to an elementary school math teacher. Clever Hans is, was able to do additions and subtractions. So you could ask him, what is 10 plus 10? And he would respond by tapping his hoof 20 times. So we can use from animals these information about learning and memory and extrapolate that to humans. And in some ways, it is necessary. It is necessary because with animal research, we can control the environment in which our animals are raised. And that allows us to understand the effect of the environment on learning and memory. We can control their learning history and see the impact of previous learning exposure on new memories that are formed. It allows us to control genetic makeup. And that allows us to then investigate the role of particular genes in learning and memory. And also because of ethical reasons, because sometimes we need to use procedures that we wouldn't be able to use in humans. So for all this, animal research is extremely important. Um, but the good thing is that there is a lot of commonalities between cognitive processes that are used in learning and memory in both animals and humans. So we are able to extrapolate the findings that we get from animal research, which of, with, of course, a little bit of caution, that's for sure. But these basic processes remain the same. So how are memories stored in our brain? It all begins with our senses. So our senses are going to capture information around us in our environment, and all this information is going to be sent into our sensory memory, where information here is going to last less than one second. So our sensory memory is bombarded by information that comes in from our eyes, our ears, our hands, etc. cetera. Um, but the information will essentially just be in and out except for the salient information. Information that is salient enough to capt our attention will attract our attention, and this information will be transferred on to our short-term memory, where now information will remain for less than one minute. 
unless we judge this information as being important, okay? So there are certain things that catch our attention that we see. For example, these water bottles, if I'm thirsty, are going to catch my attention. But if I'm distracted right away, I'm gonna forget about these water bottles. But if I am actually thirsty and I'm going to go grab these water bottles, I am going to work with this information and rehearse it in a certain way. So I'm going to work with this information. If I do pay attention to this information, it will now be transferred onto my long-term memory where here the information can remain permanently for, my, for the entire lifetime. The nice thing is that once information is uh, stored in the long-term memory, we can access it again. So we can retrieve this information, bring it back to our short-term memory where we can work with this information. And actually, the short-term memory is also called working memory because this is information that is salient and we're able to use this information in our actions. So where is information stored in the brain? So what we see when we look at the brain is essentially lots of electrical circuits that are connected to one another. And when we zoom into our brain, we see all these tiny cells, these neurons that are connected to one another and that communicate together. So memory is stored at the level of our neurons. So it is um, stored in this basic element um, throughout the brain. So it is really distributed throughout the brain. And this information is embedded in the brain through neuroplasticity. Now, neuroplasticity is a process where we know that learning and information from our environment can come and change the brain, can create new neurons, can create new connections between neurons, or synapses, like we call them, can change the biochemical signals in the brain, um, like increasing neurotransmitter release. All that is neuroplasticity. While we know that learning will impact neuroplasticity, it is still a concept that remains a little bit ambiguous to researchers, but we're working on clarifying it. We can study spatial orientation using animal models. And animals have taught us that we actually navigate in our environment using maps. So we create these cognitive maps where we not only locate stimuli within our environment, but also our position in comparison to the stimuli in our environment. So animals are useful when we are studying spatial orientation because they live in an environment that is much less defined than our environment. We have created so many artificial landmarks and we use all sorts of tools that help us navigate in our environment like GPS, our phone, and so on. Animals don't use that. So we can understand how spatial orientation is encoded using the animal brain. Two tests that are commonly used in research with animals is the Morris water maze and the radial arm maze. In the Morris water maze, there is a platform that is hidden uh, just under the water, and the animals have to learn to use landmarks around the pool to locate themselves and um, locate the position of the platform. In the radial arm maze, there is food that is hidden at the end of each of these arms. And the animals have to complete the radial arm maze in a given amount of time by remembering the arms they have already visited and consumed the food that was in it. An interesting finding that we see with spatial orientation in animals, and it applies to humans too, is that males actually outperform females when it comes to spatial orientation. And that seems to be because of low levels of estrogens um, in the body and in the brain. But what is nice too is when women enter menopause and estrogen levels decrease, we see a marked increase in spatial orientation. So these are findings that we first found with animals and then also found that they apply to humans. So I'd like to leave you with my final slides that the brain is unique. The brain allows us to interact with our environment, to extract information from our environment, to tuck it away so that we can retrieve it later on when we need it, and also to modify these memories if they become non-accurate anymore. 
Thank you very much for your time. So we'll have some time for questions um, a little bit later. I would love to listen to Dr. Ismail uh, teach her classes. I'm sure she's a marvelous lecturer. Um, the, our next speaker is Dr. Frank Knopfel. So he co-leads the memory and cognition pillar in the Brain and Mind Research Institute. Dr. Knopfel is a physician at the Briere Memory Program in Ottawa, and he's a senior investigator in the Research Institute at Briere. He has appointments in the Department of Family Medicine, systems in, here at, at the University of Ottawa, and also in systems in computer engineering at Carleton. He's done a lot of admin experience, um, and his research interests are focused on the use of sensors in order to facilitate aging in place. So he co-founded about 25 years ago, I want to guess, the TAFTA program of research. Maybe not, maybe 15, more like 15. So after spending many years working on bed-based sensors to monitor physical well-being, such as how people transfer out of bed and how people breathe at night, how liquid moves in your body when you're sleeping, um, he's now focused more on cognition. And so he's really trying to understand how sensors in the home can monitor activities of daily living and soon um, how and using artificial intelligence to be able to help cue people uh, in their house, so really turning the home into a smart home. Cognitive decline can also affect driving ability, and his team is now studying how technology can help assess and improve driving safety in older adults. So we go from the navigation of small rodents to navigation in our aging adults. Thank you, Heidi. Thank you, Nafisa, uh, Dr. Slack, and uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, tonight, I'm going to take a little bit of time to talk to you about one of the challenges um, I face in my clinical practice every day, and that is aging people with cognitive decline and its impact on driving. So we all want to retire like this, driving independently, and what we don't want to do is end up driving like this in the middle of a field and then wondering where we are, right? And so what I plan to talk about tonight is uh, talk about driving the physical requirements and the cognitive requirements, uh, a little bit about the anatomy of navigation. So you saw the map of the brain a little bit earlier. We're going to do a little bit more about navigation. We're going to talk about aging and dementia um, and uh, then look at how we test navigation likely in, in clinic and then talk about future technology, uh, automation, and uh, GPS. Uh, so uh, this young man here is giving us a great start. As Nafisa said, it all starts with we have to be able to see um, and we have to be able to hear. So the driving, to be able to drive, we need to have vision and hearing. We also need neck mobility. So a nice shoulder check right here from uh, this young man. Heart and lungs are in good shape, and of course we need arms and legs to drive the car. So now we're going to the brain, and uh, we need visual spatial ability. So it's one thing for the eyes to see, it's another thing for us to be able to judge distance and space. So here this car is passing a truck, and hopefully he has used his mirror and done some checking, and, and he's not going to cut off the truck. So distance between vehicles is important for visual spatial ability. Staying in the lane, right? Knowing on one side you have a solid line, on the other side you have a dotted line. How do we stay in the lane? Using our mirrors, right? On one side, objects are a little closer than they appear, right? Parking, and then left turn into oncoming traffic. This is the most challenging driving task because cars are coming from the front, and you have to figure out, do I have enough space, right, to turn into them? Memory is actually not that important for driving, even though we need to memorize signs and traffic lights and things like that. Um, we overlearn that so massively that it's actually not typically memory problems that affect driving ability. Um, although, of course, we need to know our way around the car, and in this case, uh, this car has uh, way too many buttons uh, to have to learn, uh, but uh, that's, that's about the place where memory uh, works. More importantly, though, is executive functioning. So 
when you decided to come here tonight, you planned the trip. You thought about, well, which route am I going to go? Do I have enough gas for that trip? You calculated probably about how long it would take to get here. Um, and then you probably said, well, how do we avoid uh, the, the 5 o'clock rush hour um, and any other trip you'd want to see? Do I want to drive at night? What about the construction along the way? So it's planning, and that's executive functioning. Also involved multitasking, right? We have to take information from our vehicle. How fast am I going? How fast am I allowed to go? Where am I going? What's the street coming up? When am I turning? And risks, right? All the other vehicles are on the road as well, and we have to adapt to their uh, situation. Speed of processing is really important because it's the speed that it takes the brain to go from seeing something or hearing something and reacting to it. So see, act, evaluate, was this the right action? and then react if I need to adjust. So let's say I'm driving along, I'm using my full visual field, and I see a bicycle uh, coming down the driveway. So I see it, and I go, hmm, um, it's a child. Uh, I might want to take my foot off the gas just in case they come all the way down the driveway and they're not paying attention. Um, I do that, and I see how much slower am I going, and I see the bicycle is still moving. Now I have to go, am I going to put my foot on the brake, and am I going to stop, right? Because I do have to react. So that speed of processing is essential um, for functioning. Now, this person's executive functioning isn't working quite as well as we'd like. But what about navigation? So for navigation, there's sort of two important parts, right? I'm the little red uh, beetle and I need to get some gas, right? So first of all, where am I? With respect to the gas station, where am I? Um, and then there's the other part of navigation, which is sort of that wayfinding. So um, there's two. One is getting to a known place. The second is getting to a place I've never been before. So those are kinds of variants of navigation we require. And that's not just for driving, it's for all. So here's the brain very quickly. This is the right brain. We've uh, cut out the left brain, and we're looking at the right brain through the inside, okay? And you see that we have uh, on the front, the, the blue is the frontal lobe. You have the parietal lobe behind, the occipital lobe in the very back, and then the temporal lobe, which we're seeing um, from, again, through the brain um, and from the inside. And that little red strip that you see over there is the hippocampus, uh, right? Whoops, that's wrong button. The top, yeah, there we go. So this is the hippocampus here. So this is the temporal lobe, and on the inside we have the hippocampus. And that is where the memory sits. So let's go back to navigation. So I need to see. And I didn't design the brain, but some, for some reason the eyes are at the front, and the part of the brain that actually understands what we see is at the very back. Not great design, but we'll go with it. Um, right nearby is a landmark position, right? So now I see, but now I need to sort of go uh, in space. Where am I with respect to the local church, the school, um, parliament, any landmark that I have? Not far away from that, a little further out, uh, also in the parietal lobe, is where we sort of understand where we are with respect to where we want to go. So egocentric, where I am, uh, navigation. Now, if we go to the hippocampus, our ability to imagine a map is actually in the hippocampus. And so if I say, um, imagine a map and imagine the route to go from Parliament um, to the, uh, the Mint, right? Then you can imagine Sussex and, and turning left and then going, or Wellington turning left on Sussex, then you can get, find your way to the, to, uh, the Mint. So, um, that ability to visualize, that's memory, and that sits in the hippocampus. And not far away in the parahippocampal region is sort of our ability to construct a scene. So if I go and now visualize the parliament building, visualize Wellington in front of it, you can do that. And again, um, that's in, in the parahippocampal region. Executive functioning, like I said, anything that has to do with planning and for correcting, I'm going down the street and I want to go to where I want to go, but there's an accident, now I have to do a detour. That replanning, refocusing will be the executive functioning. That's the newest part of the brain, the frontal part of the brain. 
So what happens uh, as we age? Firstly, again, uh, vision is essential because we need to see where we're going. So unfortunately, our vision deteriorates as we age. We get cataracts, macular degeneration, glaucoma. Uh, and in addition, diseases like diabetes and vascular disease are going to impact our vision even further. So as you know, these are diseases that increase as we age. So that's compounded. Hearing. We uh, decline as well, uh, and again, diabetes, vascular disease, and certain types of medications can impact our hearing. Now, what about the brain? The bad news is that after about the age of 30, we lose about 50,000 brain cells a day on average. All right, so that's 20 million brain cells in a year. If we start with about 20 billion, it's about 0.1%. But it does mean that between the ages of 30 and 90, we lose about a tenth of our brain in mass, right? And by the way, while you're sitting here listening to me, about 500 of them are going. <laughs> so all this brain aging, what does it actually do to our ability to drive? So the first thing is our qualitative judgment changes, our awareness of other drivers around, our ability to control speed, manage speed, um, changes. And in particular, we drive more slowly. We all have seen sort of the characteristic, right? You're driving along, and there's a slow-moving car you pass, and you expect a certain age in there. Um, increasing errors at intersections, that left turn, we're more likely to cause other cars to honk and, and come to a screeching halt uh, when we do that. Lane departure, again, a little bit of that drift. We're not paying quite attention. We're looking at the car in front of us not to hit them, but we're drifting a little bit left and right, um, departing. Um, and we get the occasional unexpected braking because we uh, are not as sensitive to what's about to change in front of us, so it happens almost unexpectedly, and we hit the brakes. So what happens is, as we age, our hearing, our vision goes a little down, our brain gets a little slower, so we're not quite as good at driving. So what happens is, we get honked at, we, we cut a car off, and, and we're like, and, and, and our confidence is affected by this. Who likes it, right? Who wants to be honked at? So we lose a little bit of confidence. What happens is then, the next time we go driving, we go, you know what, rather than driving three times over the next few days, I'm going to try and put it all into one day, be more efficient, right? Uh, makes sense, we're saving the environment, but we're also driving less, we're getting less practice, which means we are going to lose our competence, right? And if we lose our competence, and then our vision is going, and our hearing is going, and our brain is going, right, our f we're going to be even worse off and we're going to get honked at more. And so you can see this is kind of a feed-forward cycle, unfortunately, um, that happens. Now, we talk, that's healthy aging. What about dementia? So here, you're going to see that around 1986, there were 15,000 drivers with dementia in Ontario. Um, it doubled in 1998. And it will triple again by 2028, expecting around 100,000 drivers are going to have dementia. Um, that's ex anticipated in 2028. So in Alzheimer's disease, what do we know about Alzheimer's disease? It does affect our memory. It can affect our orientation, our concentration. Eventually, it affects our ability to do things like manage the finances, making meals, and that kind of thing. What does it do to navigation ability specifically? It's harder to recognize landmarks because we don't remember. It's harder to locate landmarks on a map. So figuring out where is the parliament on this map. Um, ordering landmarks on a path is harder. And the relative location of a picture. So I have a picture of parliament. Now, where is it compared to the Mint, compared to the Rideau Center? Right? So visualizing that sequence. Um, and recently, we found that, in fact, um, these are more sensitive and more specific uh, markers of dementia than the memory loss. That's sort of we talk about classically. Because um, there's a lot of diseases that have memory loss. Um, these, some of these navigation changes are actually much more specific. So what happens to people with Alzheimer's disease that get lost? Because that's what we're talking about. So there was a review in 2010 uh, published in the American Journal of Occupational Therapy where they looked at 207 lost drivers with Alzheimer's disease. 
They range, ranged in age from 58 to 94. And to get this, they ended up being found between two and 2,700 kilometers from where they were going. Okay? And so when they were found, there were 81 that were alive. There were 35 that were injured, 32 that were dead, and 70 at the time of publication of this journey, journal of 207 that were lost, 70 had not at all been found yet. So they, this is serious, right? The ability to navigate is serious and has serious consequences. So how do we test navigation at the clinic? Actually, we're not very good at all at testing navigation. It's not part of the tools we use at the Brera Memory Program, and I don't think there's a lot of clinics that actually use it. The closest thing we have is what we call the Trails B test, and here we have alternating numbers and letters, so you see it goes 1A, 2B, 3C, and, and you go on and, and do this. So, there's a couple of things. One is there's a predetermined sequence. Everyone knows one, two, three, four, five. Uh, everyone knows A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Um, it's the ability to do two things at once. So going number, letter, number, letter, where am I? Um, and the shifting part of it. So it's as close as we can get to navigation. And in fact, it is one of the tools we do use to test driving uh, ability. We're hoping uh, in the near future to get a driving simulator. Of course, this would be a, a very interesting tool because we can set a plan on there. We can practice the drive and say, okay, here's the church, turn right, and then here's the school, turn left, um, and then see if the person can navigate around uh, using a simulator where there's no danger um, to anyone. So I figured I'd talk a little bit about GPS because it is about navigation. Many of you may have actually programmed the GPS in your car to get here. Here's a built-in one. You might have one stuck on your windshield. Um, so what do we know about GPSs and older adults? So in 2018, very recently, uh, Thomas uh, published an article about older adults and GPS and found that, not surprisingly, drivers 70 and over make more driving errors than drivers 60 and over, right? We'd already gone through that. We've said all the reasons why that is. Now, they said, well, what happens with electronic navigation devices? So they said, uh, what they found is that it helped reduce driving errors in both groups compared to maps, okay? So if you use a paper map while you're driving, Right? It's a little scarier than if you're looking at your navigation device. Um, and uh, so a navigation device is smart. It, it zooms in and out as you speed up and slow down. So there's a lot of reasons why that is. Um, so they do help us with errors. However, the navigation device actually didn't reduce our navigation errors. Okay, so if you're looking at a map and you're driving down a certain street and you're looking to turn right on a certain street, right down Main, turning right on Church, right, you're going to miss it one out of five times if you're looking at the map because you're just going to miss it. Um, it turns out using an electronic navigation device, you're just as likely to miss the cutoff. Even though it says 100 meters, 50 meters, whatever, you may not uh, catch it. Um, so, and, and then not, so they didn't reduce navigation errors um, in either group, uh, and the 70 plus group, of course, continued to do worse than the 60 plus group. So, navigation devices are good, uh, but they're not perfect. Now, driving automation overall is a whole other kettle of fish. We're talking about GPS, but we know that the navigation, we're increasing the autonomy of our cars, right? And we're looking at the future. So we know that in flying, that pilots that flew uh, more and more automatic planes that did less and less, when the plane came into an emergency, they actually had lost a lot of their driving skills or flying skills. And in particular, the flying skills associated with unstable conditions, right? If we said take off and land, they could do it. But if they're landing and the system malfunctions and they're about to go off the runway, fixing that uh, was really hard. And there's no political intent whatsoever with the plane uh, being called the Trump's plane that was being used in this picture. <laughs> It's out of control, it ran off the rails, you name it, all the, all the jokes that work on this. Um, so, so 
the question is, how will reliance on GPS affect navigation in older ability in older adults, right? If we get so used to using the GPS, will we actually lose our abil ability to navigate? And by the way, that's not just for older adults, right? My daughter has no sense of direction in Ottawa because she plugs it into the GPS, she gets there, she gets out, and she comes home with the GPS, and I go, which way do you go? I don't know, right? What, what streets did you take? I don't know. I followed the GPS, right? So, so we don't know what the larger impact on cognition is if we keep substituting our actual skills uh, with uh, autonomy. So, in conclusion, all drivers have a minimal physical and cognitive ability they need to drive safely. Um, and, and that's why we don't have four-year-olds drive, right? Um, unfortunately, on the far end of our age spectrum, we will lose our cognitive abilities. Um, and our ability to drive safely deteriorates uh, with age. And hopefully technology can help us. And as an aside, early difficulties in navigation may in fact be a sign of developing Alzheimer's disease that is more sensitive and more specific than the usual learning 12 uh, words on a list. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much um, for the great presentation, Dr. Ismail and Dr. Knopfel and uh, Dr. Sveistrup for coming. And this is just one example of our collaborations with the Briere Research Institute and the Memory Collaborative. And so now I'm going to introduce our keynote speaker for tonight, and you're in for a real treat. We have Dr. Tony Hakim, and he is the founding director of the University of Ottawa Brain and Mind Research Institute. He's also the founding director and CEO of the Canadian Stroke Network. And the Canadian Stroke Network, which was founded by Dr. Hakim and started here in Ottawa, actually completely changed stroke uh, treatment, not only in Canada, but internationally. And now patients that have a stroke have a lot more hope <coughs> for recovery than they ever did before. And that's because of the work for doctor, of Dr. Hakim. And so as you can imagine, he's the recipient of many awards, and I'm not gonna list them all because I'll be here for a half an hour, but I'll just mention two. One of them is that he's an offer, officer of the Order of Canada that he got in 2007. He's also a recipient of the Gardner Whiteman Award, which was for his outstanding contribution in stroke research and stroke care. And um, this, these studies have changed the lives of stroke survivors. And you may not know this, but 50% of Gardner laureates go on to win a Nobel Prize. So this is a very prestigious award. And he's also the author of a book, Save Your Mind, Seven Rules to Avoid Dementia. And that book will be available for sale out in the lobby. And this is going to be the topic of his uh, seminar today. So welcome, Dr. Akeem, and thank you so much. Thank you. So he's wonderful, but can he give a talk? Um, the usual custom is to start my talks, and this is expected of all clinicians, uh, saying that I'm not on the take from a drug company. I'm not going to try to sell you a drug that I have been a consultant over. So here is my list. I uh, really have no conflicts of interest. <laughs> so um, I have only a limited amount of time and a lot of slides. So. Forgive me for rushing through them. I'm going to try to pick the important point in each slide. And this has already been alluded to uh, by my colleagues, and that is that 
currently, there is about a million Canadians, and we're 36 million today or something, a million Canadians who are struggling with memory problems. And number six, the cost of taking care of Canadians, because you have to remember, it's not just the person who has developed memory difficulties who's now not working and not paying taxes, but usually somebody else is now taking care of them who has had to also decrease her, usually her, uh, um, um, uh, activities, professional activities. And so this is a very costly disease. Now, the brain has only so much storage capacity, and what it does is that it gets rid of stuff that you are not using and haven't used in a long, long time. That's called normal forgetting. It's not dementia. You're not expected to remember the name of the kid you went to grade school with uh, who sat in the third row behind you. So even though you knew it at that time, the brain teases out stuff you're not needing over time, and it's called normal forgetting. Mild cognitive impairment is important to understand because it is the phase when the memory trouble is still correctable, is still reversible. And when do you know that you have mild cognitive impairment? It's when the memory difficulty is not interfering with your efficiency at work or at home. The kids still say, Mom, the food tastes just as good as it always did, so you're not mixing things up and you're doing very well. But damn, again and again, you're heading to that fridge to get something, and by the time you get to the door, you can't remember what it was you came for. So you step back a few steps, ah, yeah, that's what it was. It was the cheese or whatever, and you head to the fridge and you get it. So it is memory lapses that are not sufficient to interfere with the ability to function. Dementia is when you have difficulties with all kinds of spheres of, of, of uh, cognitive ability, thinking, memory, executive function, and it interferes with your efficiency. Your colleagues at work come up to you and say, Joe, are you okay? What's going on? You're not functioning. That, when it begin, begins to interfere with your life, that's significant. So um, we have spent a great deal of time following Mr. Alzheimer's lead on this, what he taught us. And unfortunately, he put us on the wrong path. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. There are many types we used to say. Alzheimer's disease, which I'm going to describe very quickly, we used to say is the most common reason for uh, declining memory. What is Alzheimer's disease? Well, Mr. Alzheimer, Dr. Alzheimer's received brains of people who had become demented and looked at them under the microscope, and he found spots. There were spots on those brains. There were what we call plaques and tangles inside the neurons in the brain. And it turned out that these were uh, unhealthy, un uh, unhealthy proteins that are not normal. In, it's not what you see normally in the brain, but unhealthy proteins that accumulate in the brain. And so all of us have been focusing on the fact that Alzheimer's disease, dementia, must be due to the accumulation of these nasty proteins in the brain. Drug companies have spent billions of dollars successfully getting rid of these proteins accumulated in the brain without any impact on the memory function of the people who had them. So it ain't the proteins. It ain't these nasty proteins. It ain't these spots in the brain that are the cause of dementia. How did we get to where we are now? Well, one important study was they looked at the brains of patients who had died with dementia. And they said, wait a minute, something else is going on here. A very high percentage of these patients also have vascular disease. They have had strokes. They have had heart attacks. They had high cholesterol levels. They were smokers. And a very high percentage of people who had 
had developed memory difficulty uh, had associated vascular disease. This is a complicated slide I'm going to simplify for you, but it is the most important thing I'm going to say tonight. And, he, and here is what this slide says. These were healthy controls. These were people who had absolutely no trouble with memory difficulties. And so there was hundreds of them who were studied very extensively with all these things which we're going to talk about. But we started with totally normal people. Then we called them to come back when they developed early mild cognitive impairment. Then we, and we repeated all the studies. Then we called them after they developed late mild cognitive impairment and studied them again. And then late onset Alzheimer's disease. At this stage, they were demented. And we studied them again. And here is, and, and what did we study? We looked at all of these things. We looked at those proteins that accumulate in the brain that, that Dr. Alzheimer had said, that is the reason for Alzheimer's disease. We looked at that because we're able to see that and study the deposit. We looked at whether the brain was metabolically active or not. We looked at the vascular supply in the brain. We tested them for memory. We, looked, we did MRI studies and looked at the structure of the brain. We tested their memory. We did lumbar punctures and looked at the CSF and analyzed it extensively. And then we put all of that information on this graph. Guess what? The very first thing that goes wrong with the brain, before you have any inkling at all that your memory function is going to be suffering, is that blood supply to the brain goes down. When the blood supply to the brain goes down, two awful things happen. Number one, you're, the brain is lacking energy, and so you don't think. Keeping memory alive is very energy expensive. And so when blood supply to the brain goes down, there is less energy available to the brain, and so it starts acting up. But the second important thing that happens is that your brain is always consuming energy. It is, it is like the, a 12-cylinder engine with the accelerator on the floor all the time. What happens is you need tune-up. If that's your car, you need tune-up. Your brain needs tune-up. The tune-up happens at night while you're sleeping. We're going to talk about that. But if you don't have enough blood coming into the brain, you're not getting the tune-up you need. And so crap that accumulates because the brain is so energetic accumulates. And those were the proteins that, Mr. that Dr. Alzheimer had identified. So it wasn't the proteins. The proteins are a consequence of the disease. They're not the disease. The disease is lack of blood supply to the brain. If I were to put red dye in all your blood vessels, don't be surprised that the brain is red hot. It, it has, what is it? Uh, each brain contains 600 kilometers of blood vessels and cap each brain. You can go to Montreal and back three times or whatever if for all the blood vessels that you've got in your brain. It is desperately in need of blood supply. You mess with that. And the brain is going to tell you. The brain is going to punish you. <laughs> the brain is going to suffer. And so that's, that's the condition. OK. A number of conditions make cognitive impairment and dementia more likely. We owe a great deal of debt to Debbie Barnes, who in 2011 said, what comes with dementia? What are the conditions that, that seem to go hand in hand with cognitive impairment? And so we see all the stuff on the left that leads to a decrease in the blood supply to the brain. Low education, what? Low education, yeah. Every time you learn something, you're opening new blood channels to the brain so that that memory can remain active and alive. And if you don't go to high school and you don't finish school, 
you are going to have a brain that hasn't been pushed to learn, and that is going to have a cost. Smoking, physical inactivity. You sit on your ass, you're going to pay for it. <laughs> Depression, hypertension, diabetes, obesity. So people said, wait a minute, wait a minute. You mean if I continue pushing myself to be educated, if I don't smoke, if I keep physically active, if I get connected with my environment and feel happy and not allow myself to go down in the dumps, control my blood pressure, avoid diabetes or treat it if I have it, and avoid getting heavy, I will decrease my risk for dementia? And the answer was absolutely yes. So your buddy here sat down and wrote a book about it because I thought these messages have to be transmitted to the public. This is not about doing research in my lab, which I'm happy to do, but, but really there are messages here for everyone. So we control, you control, a major part of how you age. So the seven rules are listed here, and I'm not going to read them because I'm going to go through them um, one, one, one by one. And I put it all in a book. And so here is rule number one. Push your brain to learn. To push your brain to keep active. It was tax time, and I happened to go to the cafeteria, and I see a colleague sitting, so I'm joining him. And I go and sit down with him, and he's got his iPhone out, and he's subtracting two large numbers, one from the other. And um, he discovers that his iPhone is, is out of battery, out of juice. So he gets a piece of paper, he writes down the two numbers, and draws a line underneath them, and he's going to subtract them. And he looks at me and he says, do you subtract from right to left or from left to right? <laughs> If you haven't done it in a while, the brain is going to ship that information out. It's too expensive to keep memory alive for something you are not using. The contrary of that is also true. Do you remember your, wife's, your husband and your wife's birthday? Do you remember the birthdays of all your kids? Do you remember the birthdays of all your good friends, your cousins? No? Write it down and learn it and test yourself every once in a while. Do you play Sudoku? If you play Sudoku all day long, your brain is going to be bored to death. <laughs> so the brain, in addition to persistence, wants variety. Get variety built into what you force your brain to learn, because that's how it works. Grow your brain's capacity for cognitive function. Use it or lose it applies to your brain's memory functions. Cognitive reserve is defined as your ability to do things with your brain even though it has those d nasty spots in it. So you can work better than what the spots might predict you could. Cognitive reserve can only be increased through persistence and variety. Stimulate your brain's cognitive functions by writing, not texting. And the reason I say not texting is that the damn thing spells it for you before you even start. So, you know, teach yourself how to spell. Reading, memorizing, calculating, planning, mapping. Our colleague told us about the importance of developing a map for where you're going to go. Music, turns out, is incredibly important for memory function. And if you join a choir, just think how complicated that is. Not only do you have notes in front of you that your brain is going to read and translate into a sound that you're going to produce, that's pretty complicated already. But if you're in a choir, you also have to harmonize that with four other groups of sounds that are coming around you. So music is incredibly important to push your brain to function better. These sisters taught us a lot because they were tested while they were alive, and they allowed us to look at their brains after they died. And number two, 
61 of them showed these spots in their brains that Mr. Dr. Alzheimer said, that is Alzheimer's disease. But only 35 of them showed any uh, uh, difficulty with memory. What does that say? That says you can work with your brain better than what those spots would have predicted. You can overcome the deficits that are caused by, by pushing your brain to learn, to memorize, to function, to write. And so um, that's how you build cognitive reserve. It's like your bank account, right? You don't want to spend it. You want to keep a bit of reserve for, for difficult days. Here's a, 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 a slide that says that in London, England, you cannot become a taxi driver until you have learned every street, every street of London, England. It takes four years to accomplish this feat. And there are multiple examinations that are done along the way. After four years, some people made it and got their taxi driver's license, and some people failed. And so this paper had the smart idea of, hey, let's look at the two brains here of the two groups of people. Guess what? Those who had passed their exams had bigger brains. Your actual physical structure in your brain will grow if you push it to learn. I can go home right now. You've, you've, lear you've learned everything I want you to learn. Reduce the debit calls on your mind. Dot Slack referred to the Canadian Stroke Network, and one of the biggest drivers of dementia is stroke. So here is a large area of the brain that has been injured because this patient developed a stroke that was not treated. Um, Symptomatic stroke is a major cause of dementia. Cognitive decline is present in 61% of all symptomatic strokes within three months, and the risk of dementia increases with time. And here is the good news. Stroke is now treatable. 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 The way we came to that conclusion is that we learned that there is something called penumbra. And the penumbra is a part of the brain that's sort of peripheral to the center of the stroke that is, is deprived of its blood supply, but not enough to die, but enough to go on strike. So the patient who suddenly gets a stroke may have arm weakness and face weakness, but the face weakness may be due to a part of the brain that is irreversibly damaged but the arm weakness may be due to a part of the brain that is in the penumbra all at once. It's, it's on strike, but it's alive. And all it needs is a bit of blood supply to get back to function. And so um, there was suddenly a drug. Most strokes, as you all know, are due to blood clots that are traveling into the brain. And uh, colleagues in the US discovered a drug that makes the blood clot bust, makes it break up. And so if the patient is rapidly identified as suffering from a stroke, rapidly taken because, because someone called 911, not somebody put them in the car and drove them. Because if you do that, you may take them to a hospital that is not prepared to, to treat them the modern way. Call 911 the ambulance knows where to take the patients to get the right attention. And so it was discovered that, yeah, patients come in paralyzed, and an hour later, some of them go home. And here's what you do at home if your partner suddenly is having trouble with their arm or their leg or their face or you think they're having a stroke. It's called FAST. Face is a drooping. Is the face one side drooping compared to the other? Is, is the arm going like this? Can, can they raise both arms? Is the speech slurred? If any of these three things are happening, call 911. 
when the Canadian Stroke Network came into existence in 2000, this drug, TPA, had been approved five years earlier. And in Canada, only 1% of stroke patients were getting it. And we thought it was, a cr it was a crime. So we made a proposal to the government to establish a network across the country to teach my colleagues, the physicians, the emergency room, the public, the neurologists, and I can spend hours talking to you about, about all of the, all of the uh, hurdles that we had to go through. But nonetheless, there was success, and now stroke, if attended to rapidly, can be treated. And not only do we give a drug to bust the clot, we now rapidly also thread a little line to the clot. We go hook it and pull it out. So endovascular thrombectomy can be, can, is available in, certainly in this hospital at the, at the, gen, at the civic and at the, and at the general. And, and um, it allows patients a bit longer time to get themselves to um, the attention of a, a hospital. Evident strokes, which is what I described, evident because the patient is aware that something is not right, evident strokes are now treatable, but we have a problem, and that is that there are strokes that are too small for people to be aware of them that are happening, and they are called covert strokes. Covert strokes are ones that patients do not feel, and they are very common. And People with vascular risk factors get them. And here's what they look like. You remember that big area of dark darkness and the CT scan that I showed you a minute ago and I said, this is a stroke. Well, these are strokes that are happening that the patients do not feel. But these are not harmless. Small vessel disease is the result of any process that damages small end arteries, arterial. Remember that picture where I put the red dye in the blood? The brain was full of these tiny blood vessels. And if any of them gets occluded, uh, the patient may not be aware of it because it's, it's a tiny uh, event, but it will show up on the MRI scan. So these are covert strokes. But Get enough of them, and there's going to be dementia. In the brain, these infarcts are associated with strokes, psychiatric decline, gait abnormalities, and dementia. And here is the other bad news, is that small blood vessels that are impacted by this condition in the brain are also being impacted in the kidney and in the retina. So the combination of blindness, needing dialysis, and dementia often go hand in hand uh, in, in patients who are having small vessel disease. So at all, at all costs, this should be avoided. And uh, who is a candidate for small vessel disease? Any vascular risk factor may result in small vessel disease. Individuals with high blood pressure, obesity, uh, untreated diabetes, hyperlipidemia, smokers, sedentary lifestyle. These are the conditions that led me to write the book, and each one of those words is a chapter in the book. Chronic insufficient sleep is a risk factor for small vessel disease. All of us need to sleep seven to eight hours a night. This is not a political comment, but Mr. Trump sleeps only five. And loneliness and depression are risk factors for small vessel disease. Monitor and tame your blood pressure. This was patients with hypertension had a very high incidence of small vessel disease. <clears throat> Here is a graph that I want to share with you. If you invite me to come to your house when you are in your 50s, and I measure your blood pressure, and let's say that you don't change your blood pressure. It stays at that level. And I come 25 years later, and I test you for cognitive function. This is the relationship 
And this is the graph. For every one millimeter increase in blood pressure, one millimeter, your chances of acquiring dementia is increased by 1%. Above a resting systolic blood pressure, the higher number of 120. So my recommendation is that you invest in a blood pressure cuff. None of that comes into my pocket. I'm just telling you to buy a blood pressure cuff. And once a week, when you're calm, when you're rested, when nobody's hassling you, when you're not pissed off and upset about anything, <laughs> you, you take your blood pressure and you write down the date and the value and you bring that accumulated data to your family physician whenever you go see your family doctor. The goal is for the higher number to be at 120 as much as possible. If it's 124, don't panic. And you know it's not the end of the world, but the goal is 120 systolic. Hypertension, systolic blood pressure at rest is goal compatible with healthy brain function. The SPRINT study concluded that when they compared 120 to 140, 120 was associated with much lower incidence of heart disease, vascular disease, and eventually they analyzed these people for a cognitive function, and it turns out that at 120, their brain cognitive function is preserved compared to 140. Rule number four, you didn't know I was a poet, did you? Eat right, weigh light, and stay bright. <laughs> Let me start by saying that this is not about fat shaming. I have as much respect and appreciation for a patient of mine who weighs 400 kilo pounds as, as I do for someone who, weigh, who weighs much less than that. This is not about, but unfortunately, we have to come to the recognition that obesity is a disease. It's not just shape of a figure. It's a disease. When, and, and the bigger problem is that the rate of obesity in North America, in Canada, and in North America is increasing all the time. We, liked, we like bacon a bit too much. But, but that's the, the problem is that we're all continuing to accumulate a growing percentage of people with obesity. Midlife, overweight, and obesity increase late life dementia risk. There is no question about the relationship between obesity, particularly in the early years, and they do have an imp it does have an impact later on on how we function. Because the fat that we accumulate in our abdomen, it turns out, puts out inflammatory molecules that go to the brain and poison it. And there's, there's no other way of putting it. The, the brain uh, that, that is uh, in a person who has particularly abdominal obesity is being hit all the time with these nasty molecules. And visceral adipose issue is a source of inflammation and promotes small vessel disease. Now, I remember going recently to visit a friend of mine, and they're still friends of mine. And he and his wife were taking care of their grandchild. The grandchild was perhaps two years old. And the grandchild was, and, and she's a nurse. The grandchild was sitting at his little table with a little tray, and she was feeding him. And all there was on the tray was one hot dog cut up into little pieces. All I want to say, as this graph shows, is that the food we eat when we are kids, the foods we are fed when we are kids, will have an enormous impact on what we eat and what we look like in terms of obesity later on in life because that kid is gonna like hot dogs for the rest of his life, because grandma used to give it to me, right? So this is a problem in how we approach diet amongst, uh, in, the, in the young generation. Primary prevention of cardiovascular disease 
is much better with a Mediterranean diet. And among persons at high cardiovascular risk, that's the lower part here, a Mediterranean diet supplemented with extra virgin olive oil, which is part of the Mediterranean diet. I didn't know why they have to mention it again. Or nuts reduce the incidence of major cardiovascular events. It's better for the health of your blood vessels if you can maintain the Mediterranean diet as part of your, as part of your nutrition. Less dementia also has now been proven with the Mediterranean diet. What is the Mediterranean diet? Most of you probably know it very well. An abundance of fruits, vegetables, legumes, and nuts. Yeah, don't tell me there's high calorie in, in peanuts or in almonds. Yes, there is, but it, they seem to be providing the brain with something that is, that is more valuable than the few calories it's gonna cost you. Whole grain cereals, extra virgin olive oil, low intake of saturated fat, low amounts of dairy products, fish, poultry, and eggs a few times a week, and red meat only a few times a month, and a moderate amount of wine with meals. We are less sure of this last bit. Uh, <laughs> recently, there is, there is suggestion that no amount of alcohol is good for you no matter what, but hey, that's because they haven't gone to France. <laughs> Here's something else about diet and obesity that I find very, very telling, which is how does industry talk to us about what's in the food that they're wanting us to sell? This was an experiment that was done where they had a whole bunch of these large uh, soft drinks, large sweet bottles of sweet drinks sitting, and they divided kids in high school in, in two lines on either side of these bottles of, of, of soft drinks. On one side, it said, this bottle has 200, if you buy this bottle and consume it, you're going to consume 250 calories. The other one said, um, if you buy this bottle and consume it, you're going to have to walk five miles to neutralize it. Guess what? Those that said 250 calories, I don't give a shit. You know, 250 calories, I'm going to buy it and drink it where it said it's gonna, you're going to have to walk five miles to neutralize this. They said, whoa, I'm not going to do that. So how, we how industry talks to us, if there is a role that government can play, this is for, for um, anyone who, who has an impact there, um, it's very important that we really bring knowledge to where it counts to people, what they understand. It's not just what we eat. How we eat also matters. So here's a study. They, they gave two groups of people the same amount of food. Um, and in one group, they allowed them to look at their iPhones while they're eating and watch TV while they're eating. And, and the other group was pay attention to what you're eating. No distraction. Distracted individual. And at the, after the meal, they said, what did you eat? Distracted individuals were less full after lunch. Guess what? Those who didn't pay attention to what they're eating were still hungry. Distracted individuals were less full after lunch, and they ate significantly more dessert in the taste test than did non-distracted participants. And furthermore, cereal order memory for the presentation of the nine lunch. I, what did you eat? They couldn't remember because they were too busy doing other stuff. Don't do this. This is what you're not, you shouldn't be. Listen, I, I work in a busy hospital. I go to the cafeteria very, for lunch, and very frequently there is a table of eight nurses, physicians, uh, students uh, sitting. Six of them are got their iPhones out. And they're eating. They're shoveling the stuff in, but the brain is not tasting it. The brain is paying attention to what your iPhone is saying. And they're, they're not tasting it, and they're not appreciating it. And so an hour later, they're going to want to eat more because they didn't eat. They were on their iPhones. I love this one because uh, this poor kid is going to say, nobody talked to me when I was growing up. <laughs> Rule number five, I tried to find something that matched with ass, but I couldn't. So. <laughs> 
move, move your hind to save your mind. What's wrong with this picture? <laughs> they are missing an opportunity to spend a few calories by taking the stairs instead of taking the escalator. And that's something that's so ingrained in us now. You know, I see, you know, I, I go from the hospital to the university, and there are multiple doors on the way, and there is a button for handicapped people on their wheelchairs to push. Guess what? Everybody pushes on those buttons. Pull that door with your arm. You, you're going to spend a fraction of a calorie. It's a lot better for you than, than, than doing it this way. OK. Get out of breath once a day. Here's my advice in the book. Get out of breath once a day. It, if it's wintertime and there is snow out there, I don't want you to go out there and hurt yourself. Go up and down the stairs in your home until you pant. Once you reach the point of panting, you've accomplished something that's very important for your brain. It's now getting oxygenated. And it's good for your, the health of your blood vessels. Your brain needs a minimum of one hour per week of moderate effort, but thrives on 30 minutes per day. This is not about running the marathon. This is about just doing enough to pant. Try these ideas. Take stairs for less than four to five floors. The busiest point in my hospital is on the first floor waiting for the elevator. <laughs> That's where there's the biggest crowd. And yet, there are stairs on either side. And so we should learn to, to use the opportunities that are available to us to exercise a little bit, get out of breath. When you do that, your brain gets washed, and the proteins that are accumulating in there begin to ship out. But we'll talk more about that in a minute. Park away from the entrance. You know, I've. People go to a shopping center, and they drive around the, the parking lot four times to find the spot that's close to the door, when in fact, here is an opportunity to go park over there where there's lots of room and jog to the door, get out of breath, jog to the door. You can say, Dr. Hakim, that's son of a gun. He's making me do these things, but that's all right. <coughs> Don't drive to Tim Horton's window. Exercise alone without diet control is not a good way to lose weight. And excessive exercise in out of shape adults can have downsides. Don't all of a sudden decide, oh, that's what Hakim said, so I'm going to go and start jogging. If you have been sedentary all your life, that can hurt. <coughs> exercise training increases the size of the hippocampus. Our colleague just a minute ago sh showed us the importance of the hippocampus in memory function. And guess what? If you exercise, your hippocampus gets bigger. Exercise slows the accumulation of Alzheimer's pathology. Those, those nasty proteins that accumulate in the brain, if you exercise and you pant, and new blood supply, blood comes rushing to the brain, it washes away some of those accumulated proteins. Sleep enough if you want to think with ease. Uh, I'm, I'm almost done. I'm getting dirty looks here. So, so here is the, the slide about sleep. Sleep is essential. Every living creature sleeps even though it disconnects us from the environment and potentially exposes us to danger. Our ancestors lived in tents surrounded by lions and wolves and other nasty animals and still they had to sleep. That tells you something about how essential sleep is to the functioning of the human brain. Learning is consolidated during sleep. The brain's high consumption of energy produces many toxic molecules. You know that by now. And sleep is tune-up time. Sleep is when those proteins are preferentially cleaned out of the brain. It's not while you're here. It's when you're sleeping tonight. During sleep, production of the white matter in the brain is increased, and white matter repair is revved up. And there is a new drainage that's been discovered to clean out the brain, to do the tune-up that, that was discovered recently. And it is accelerated during sleep. That's when it gets, the brain gets its washout. 
And sleep deprivation accelerates brain shrinkage and has a particularly negative impact on executive function. Number seven, socialize and feel useful. Loneliness and depression can make you lose your mind, can bring on dementia. It is very common for the wife to lose her husband and gradually decline into dementia because she is lonely. Um, her neighbors say, oh, leave Catherine alone. You know, she's, she's just lost her husband. Let's not bother her. Instead of saying, how you doing? And come out, come out with me for a cup of coffee or come and visit, etc." So loneliness is very harmful. And patients with depression have a very high incidence of risk for dementia because depression has multiple effects. It changes the structure in the brain. It brings on inflammation. It reduces blood flow to the brain. And all of that leads to small vessel disease and to strokes. And that, by now you know, is the sure path to dementia. And so here are the seven rules. You've heard them all before. And I've tried, I've spent three years writing this thing because I wanted it to be understood by the man and woman in the street. So it took me a lot of work. You wouldn't believe the number of versions of this book that got written. But uh, here it is, and I thank you for your time. I hope you enjoyed this. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Hakim, for a very inspiring talk. Um, I think we'll have questions out in the lobby. So I would just like to conclude by thanking all of our speakers tonight. Uh, thank you so much. And I'd like to thank the admin team who actually organized this event. So Natasha Hollywood, who's up there. <laughs> Candice Fortier, and Victoria Rache, who's here. So thank you very much. And also, thank you to all our volunteers. So if you want more information, or if you'd like to purchase Dr. Hakeem's book, it's available out in the lobby. I just want to say, <laughs> But anyways, it's available out in the lobby. If you'd like to support research at the Brain and Mind Research Institute, you can see Natasha, and she has a, a card for you to fill out. Or if you just want more information and if you have questions for the speakers, please join us in the lobby for refreshments. And most importantly, thank you so much for being here. Uh, it's great to have you. So have a nice evening, and we'll see you out in the atrium. Thank you.